I am going to speak uh, to you about the question of DSM-5, not in a technical way. Uh, just, you know, today, uh, when you are thinking about mental disorders, mental disorders or mental disease, this is the first point. In, in neurology, you can speak about disease, and in psychiatry, you are likely, you are supposed to speak about disorders. This is the first question. DSM is about disease or disorder? We will see. And so, when you want to, when you have to speak about disorder today, you have to use the DSM. We will see that you can use the ICD also. Um, but to be honest, ICD and DSM are very close. So, here is the plan of my presentation. I will come back to the origin of the DSM. I will speak with you about the news in the DSM-5. A very big question, especially for our young colleague. Uh, does the DSM tell the truth? Because many people think that DSM-5 tells the truth. We will continue with question, the basic question, which should be the first question, what is a psychiatric disorder? Are there alternatives to DSM-5? And there are alternatives to DSM-5. And I will terminate by a conclusion. So I'm sure you know the definition, the, 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 what means DSM. DSM stands for Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorder. There is the name, the word statistics in DSM. And at the very beginning, the DSM was designed to do statistics. Why? Because if you want to do public health, you have to do statistics. You have to know how many patients there are in a country, to know how many psychiatrists you need, how many in hospitalization you need, etc., etc. And so, at the middle of the 20th century, in the United States of America, where public health is at the high level, it was decided to do statistics with mental disorders. And so, there was a need to have a manual about that, to have clear-cut definition of mental disorders. And there has been a progress, a smooth progress, with the DSM-2, 3, 4, 5, in this way of operationalizing the mental disorder with a switch around 1980, with the, of the, the appearance of the DSM-3, where the concept of reliability has been of a particular importance. Why? Because in the past, we, have, we had some kind of romantic description of mental disorder. Romanticism can be fine, but romanticism is not good to do science and to be reliable. And when physicians spoke about schizophrenia, from countries to country, and even within a country, they didn't have the same concept in mind. And there was thus a necessity to be clear about the definition of mental disorder. And this is what DSM-3 did, and it did that well indeed. And so this is uh, the first point about DSM, you know, in my country, in France, most of child and adolescent psychiatry are very critic against DSM. But to be honest, DSM is a good textbook. You can propose to resident to read the DSM in a way, this is a good way to learn one facet of psychiatry. Why? Why in the US and not in another country? I think because uh, American psychiatrists are very good at symptom recognition and symptom collection, much more than us in France. Why? In France, we focus more on the atmosphere of an interview, much more than on symptoms. And in the US, my feeling is that they focus more on symptoms 
because of sociological reason, you know, because of prosecution, the risk of prosecution, because of health insurance, they have to be pre very precise about the diagnosis of their patient and about the description of the symptoms of their patient. And so, because of that, they became experts in symptoms in psychiatry, either in adult psychiatry and in child and adolescent psychiatry. And this is the reason why the DSM is a good textbook when you focus on symptoms. The second point why DSM is good is that it is reliable, and so we have now, all around the planet, a Franca lingua, a lingua franca, a common language. We, can discuss, we have discussed this morning about schizophrenia. We all know what is schizophrenia today. And in child and adolescent psychiatry, we can speak about ADHD, ODD, conduct disorder, etc. I promise you, whether you are in Beijing, in China, in Nigeria, in Mexico, or in Paris, everybody knows what is a conduct disorder. And this is relaxing, you know. This is relaxing because you can speak with colleagues. We can speak about our patient in our own country. So this is good for communication. And this is good for research. Because when you do research, you have, you, you have the necessity to have homogeneous inclusion criteria in studies. When you do a study in schizophrenia, this is really necessary to have a reliable definition of schizophrenia, and in a way, DSM did that really well. But this is the good part of DSM. There is also the bad part of DSM. First, it is overused. You have no choice in many countries today. You are obliged to, do, to use DSM because of health insurance, for instance. If you want your patient to be reimbursed, you have to provide a DSM diagnosis in many countries. And this has an impact on clinical practice. For instance, if you consider bipolar disorders in adolescents, you know, in the past in Europe, bipolar disorders in kids and in adolescents was something very rare. It exists, but it is very rare. And in the United States, the prevalence raised amazingly. Why? Very likely because if you have a kid or an adolescent with depression and perhaps sometime he was a little bit hypomaniac, but you know, most adolescents have a mood which goes down and up. But if you need a treatment for this adolescent, bipolar disorder is a much famous disorder. And so if you say, my patient has a bipolar disorder, the patient will be, the, the treatment will be reimbursed. And so if there is an ambiguity about the diagnosis, you will choose the diagnosis that is reimbursed and bipolar is reimbursed. As opposed, for instance, with borderline personality disorder, which is much less reimbursed. And you know sometimes is it, it is not so easy to do the difference between borderline personality disorder and bipolar disorder. So first, it is overused. Second, some people say that DSM, because of a search for reliability, became superficial. We have lost <laughs> The very, uh, the most, the most fine aspects of patient description. For instance, in schizophrenia, you know there is a symptom that is called dissociation, which is, on my point of view, at the very root, in the at the very basis of the interview with the schizophrenic patient. What you experience with the patient is that he or she is dissociated. But this is very difficult to explain, and so it disappeared from the classification. And this is a pity, because if our young colleagues learn schizophrenia in DSM, they will miss dissociation, which is something crucial in schizophrenia. Second point, 
DSM is culturally biased. This is more or less true. Uh, this is very curious, in fact, that the most severe disease can be found in all countries, all over the planet, nearly with the same symptoms. If you take autism, schizophrenia, OCD, in fact, whether you are in Africa, in China, or in Europe, patients are very similar. But for the less severe disorder, this is not true. And there are even some very specific diseases. For instance, in China, you have the Koro, Koro, which is a, a fear of genital retractation. This does not exist in Europe, at, to my knowledge. So you have some diseases that are specific in some continent. And, and so Koro is not in the DSM because DSM comes from Occidental countries, Occidental culture, in particular, American culture. And something that is most often opposed to the DSM, the DSM is likely to be over-inclusive. Because in addition to the symptoms, there is a question of symptoms impairment. And you should propose a DSM diagnosis only if there is a significant clinical impairment of this, on the symptoms on the patient life. But this is very difficult to, to make it very clear. And so in practice, prevalence of mental disorder have increased with year because people have focused more on symptoms than on the impairment of the patient. And you know that there are even sociologists who claim that psychiatrists will be happy only when all people on the earth will have mental disorder. And this is especially true for child and adolescent psychiatry, you know, with ADHD, uh, with uh, mood dysregulation, etc. This is a real problem with our specialty. I will come back to that. On my point of view, the main problem with DSM, however, is that DSM today is allowed. And this is the problem. What is new in, this, in DSM-5? In fact, you know that much better than me, because to be honest, I don't use DSM, neither ICD, in my clinical practice. But because I do research a lot, I am obliged to know what is inside DSM. And so I have tried to look the differences between DSM-5 and DSM-4, and this is interesting. This is interesting on the clinical, on the scientific, and on the sociological point of view. First, as you know, we have no more Asperger syndrome. We have now an autistic spectrum disorder. We, ADHD still exists, of course. ADHD is a big success of child and adolescent uh, psychiatry according to the DSM. But now ADHD is no more in the chapter on disruptive and impulse control disorder. It is a neurodevelopmental disorder. I will come back to that. We have now a new diagnosis, which is dis disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. Something important also, you know, before in depression, <coughs> if you were in a bereavement, you were not depressed because it was supposed to be normal. And now this is not so clear. There are no more schizophrenia subtypes. In the past, OCD was an anxiety disorder. It is no more true, like PTSD. In the past, we had mental retardation. Now we have intellectual disability, etc., etc. So why this change? First, why autism spectrum disorder and not very different disease behind this large spectrum? There are objective arguments because the neurobiology of Asperger syndrome does not seem so different than the neurobiology of Caner autism. Okay, this is an argument. On my opinion, the main argument is sociological. The most mild form of autism are becoming in two fashion in Occidental countries. If you look at the American movies like Bones, for instance, the hero has an Asperger syndrome. In many movies, you have uh, 
the hero who has an Asperger syndrome. And so, I believe that our American colleague guessed that if you, if you mix the Kanner uh, form, the Kanner syndrome, with the most, the less severe form of autism, you will decrease the level of stigmatization of autism. And I think it works. It works because the appearance of the autism spectrum disorder, it, it is much easier now to discuss about autism with patient parents. So you see that these differences are not only based on statistics and neurobiology. neurobiology. This comes also from sociological um, considerations. About ADHD, so ADHD is supposed to be a neurodevelopmental disorder. Well, if you take just one minute, of course that ADHD is a neurodevelopmental disorder. It is developmental because you know that ADHD appears at three, four, five years old. It is very rare that ADHD appears af after 10. And it progresses. Most often, the symptoms decrease with time. And so, obviously, it is developmental. On the other way, of course, ADHD is related to the brain. And so, by definition, it is a neurodevelopmental disorder. The curious thing is that it is time to say that it is a neurodevelopmental disorder. On my opinion, why people do say that? Because in psychiatry and in child and adolescent psychiatry, there is at the moment a tension between the, about the question, what is a neurological disorder? What is a psychiatric disorder? This is an old tension. It exists already in my country in the, begin, in the middle of the 20th century. In, the, in about 1960, there was a discussion at that time about the existence of neuropsychiatry. Was it a good thing to split neuropsychiatry into neurology and psychiatry, and it would decide it, no. And do you know the three arguments that were uh, opposed to the split of neurology and psychiatry? The first argument was about business. If you are a neuropsychiatrist, you can see neurological patients and psychiatric patients, so you will earn more money. The second argument was uh, about stigma. If a patient go to see a neuropsychiatrist, it is not necessary because it is a psychiatric patient. It, he can be a neurological patient. And so you can freely go to a neuropsychiatrist. This is much easier to say it than to say that you go to see a psychiatrist. This was the second argument. And the third argument, French psychiatrists were opposed to be French neuropsychiatrists were opposed to become psychiatrist because at that time psychiatry was in the US and in the US psychiatrists were mainly psychoanalysts and French psychiatrists were afraid to be labeled a psychoanalyst. And this is at the same time funny and crazy because 60 years after this is exactly the opposite. Most child and adolescent psychiatrists in French are psychoanalysts, and this is the opposite in North America. And, of course, perhaps that in 60 years it will change again. So, uh, what about disruptive mood dysregulation disorder? Why is this strange wording? Because there was a problem with bipolar disorder uh, label in children and adolescents. There has been some kind of a scandal with pharmaceutical firm, etc., etc. And so it was not considered serious anymore to promote bipolar disorder in children and adolescents. But it was difficult to forget everything, and so it was suggested to use some soft words which are disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. And to be honest, these kids and these adolescents do exist.
Bereavement and depression, typically, this is a sociological question. On a clinical point of view, you have some kind of bereavements that are as painful as severe depression. And so the question and antidepressive drugs and psychological treatment can be useful in bereavement. This has been studied. And so the question, do we have to treat them or not, is a societal question. This is not a clinical question. I will just uh, point one important thing about uh, somatic symptoms. The chapter has changed and clearly I think that this is the problem at the moment we have in psychiatry about our diagnosis. Many people in a <coughs> somatic disease department are supposed to have somatic disease while in fact they have psychiatric disease and we are very embarrassed to do this diagnosis at the moment. And, uh, and DSM-5 uh, is not a complex success about that. We have still to work a lot about the border between somatic disease and psychiatric disease and this is in particular true in child and adolescent psychiatry. So uh, this is, these are the news of DSM-5. This is very uh, challenging to interpret this, this change. This is, very also, this is also very stimulating, I find. And I think a question is, uh, does DSM-5 tell the truth? Is DSM-5 better than DSM-4? Here again, to be honest, um, I have been trained with the DSM-3R. And when I have seen the DSM-4, I found it better. And when I see, when I saw the DSM-5, I consider also that there was some progress. You know, for instance, the fact that OCD is now a specific disease and not only an anxiety disorder, I think this is clinically relevant. OCD is something very particular. You can consider that social phobia, specific phobia, are phobia, okay, different, but this is the same phenomenon on a subjective point of view. OCD, as it is experienced by the patient, is something different, and there are some new scientific arguments also that are in favor of this separation. So, clearly, clearly, I consider that there is a progress here. And many of my colleagues have the same intuition, and so implicitly, it is considered that with time we are improving, and that DSM-4 was better than 3, 5 is better than 4, 6 will be better than 5, and we are converging to the true di psychiatric diagnosis, and that we are close to this moment where it will be possible to say we have the truth about mental disorder. Many of my colleagues consider ça, and personally, I consider this is completely wrong. This is completely wrong, and because this is an important point, we have to come back to the very basis. The very basis is what is a psychiatric patient. I think we already discussed that some months ago, but this is so important that we have to come back and to come back again on this topic because uh, the basis of our job is to meet with psychiatric patients. Even, you know, you, you will say, of course, this is our job, but look at the definition of medicine in most of dictionaries. I have seen in French-speaking and English-speaking official medical dictionaries, and the definition of medicine is the art or the science to diagnose, to treat, and to prevent disease. This is not the definition of the medicine. Of medicine, the definition of medicine is to deal with patients and not to deal with disease. So you see, this is really a necessity to come back to the basic. And the basic 
is the patient. And so what is the definition of the patient? I like this definition. The doctor is called by the patient. This is the definition of a patient. And so a patient is not a person with a disease. This is a person who rings to the bell of a physician. I need help because I feel inside me that I am not okay. And in psychiatry, and this is very important, and this is what makes psychiatry different as neurology, a psychiatric patient feels that inside his or her mind there is something wrong. This is not in the brain, this is not in the movement, this is in the way of the mind is functioning that the patient experiments pain. And this is the job of psychiatrists, it is to deal with this patient. Of course, the problem can come from the brain, but what experiences the patient comes from the mind. Of course, this definition is a little bit tricky for psychiatry. You know, because some schizophrenic patients do not call for the doctor, you know. Uh, but this is, of course, this is sometimes true. But most often, you know, most often, even in schizophrenia, even in severe psychotic disorder, patients are looking for some help with their mind. And in China, in adolescent psychiatry, this is even more tricky because most often the parents are bringing the patient to the physician, you know. More than at each of my uh, consultations, I ask to my patient, why uh, do you come to see me? And two times on three, they say, I don't know. You know. I don't know. And this is a real, this is a deontologic problem, you know. You are supposed to treat somebody, a human being, who don't know why he is coming. This is the reason why the definition of a child and adolescent psychiatric patient is a little bit different. I propose this definition. A child and adolescent psychiatric patient is a community, not a single subject. It is a community that calls for help for some suffering in the mind or behavior and locates the suffering in a youth. This is a little bit provocative, but this is close to what I experienced with my patient. So this is the definition of a patient. So what is the definition of a disease? There are many, many definitions of disease, and it depends uh, with languages. And this is very interesting that in English, you have, in fact, three definitions. You have the disease, and the disease is labeled by the physician. You have the illness. The illness, it is said by the patient. I am ill. And the sickness is said by the society. Your colleagues will say, oh, he is sick today. So you see that even if you look at the language, there is a tension in the definition of a disease, a disorder, etc. And this is the reason why we hesitate with mental disorder, mental disease, mental illness, etc. We never know what is a good word to say it in English. And I like this, this work of Peter Zakhar, uh, an American philosopher, who works about the question of mental disorder. And he said, well, you know, there can be plenty, plenty of definition of a mental disease. This can be a biological dysfunction. This is very in fashion at the moment with neuroscience. This can be a pattern of symptoms. This is in the DSM. You can have categories used by hand insurance. This is more and more what is important. Categories used by judge. This is also something which is becoming important. Words used in the media. I don't know if it is the case in Ukraine, but when a journalist speaks about schizophrenia, most often, this is not what we consider as schizophrenia. They speak about split, um, people who are split, who are ambivalent, not schizophrenic. And you have sociologists also who speak about, um, about a disease. For instance, a, a French sociologist which considers that depression is the weariness of self, which is 
very curious for a psychiatrist, right? I promise when you read the book, it, it makes sense. So you have many definitions of disease. And on my personal point of view, I consider that, uh, in fact, what are psychiatric disease? To understand that, you, you, you could imagine that you are uh, an extraterrestrial and, and you come into a, a museum of modern art. You see pictures, and you know, sometimes we see, I don't know if it is the same in your language, but we say that some patient, cor patient correspond to a clinical picture. Clinical picture. This is the way we see the patient. And indeed, when you see picture in a museum, you will recognize that some pictures are close to some other, you know. And we call them cubist, impressionist, surrealist picture. They have things in common. And we do cluster in an analysis in our brain to determine this cluster, and we call them disease. But there are many ways to do clusters, you know. You can do cluster with cubist, impressionist, surrealist, you can do cluster by painter. And some painters were in different movements. Picasso did cubist painting and surrealist painting. And inside, even inside a painter, there are different clusters. Picasso had the blue period, the pink period, the cubist period, etc. And you have figurative and non-figurative paintings. This is somewhat this is close to what say psychoanalysts when they discuss about patients. And you have you can use high technologies to look at with a microscope how is a painting, and this is what do uh, biological psychiatrists. So be relaxed with all this way to see paintings. This is exactly what we do with our patients. We do cluster. We do cluster according to neuroscience, psychoanalysis, statistics, etc. There is no truth in that. There are only different ways to define mental disease or mental disorder as you want. And so, now is the question, but if there are many ways to describe psychiatric disease, why is there only one or even two uh, classification? Why is there only one on this DSM? You will say, no, there is also the ICD. There, but to be honest, ICD and DSM are very close. Um, there, is, there is no real need to discriminate both. This, only with a microscope you can see difference with, uh, between the DSM and the ICD. No, no, this is not the real, uh, the real point. In fact, you have uh, alternative classification. I know three alternative classification. I will speak with you about two of them. The one that I will not discuss is the Chinese classification. There is a Chinese classification which is somewhat different than the DSM. For instance, depression is neurasthenia because of the question of stigma and because the spectrum of depression in Chinese psychiatry is much broad. But I am not a specialist of Chinese psychiatry, so I will speak about only the first one, which is the French classification that I know better. There is an old French classification in ch of child and adolescent psychiatric disease, and it exists now for adult psychiatry. Here are the main categories. <laughs> and I'm sure you will be shocked. What are the diseases in the French classification? Autism and psychotic disorder. And autism is considered a psychotic disorder. And for modern psychiatrists, to consider that autism is a psychotic disorder, this is something like a shame, you know. This is middle age. But here again, be cool. Remember what means psychosis? What means psychosis? Psychosis means that you experiment a very, in a very different way your contact with reality. This is the definition of psychosis. A different way to deal with reality. And of course, schizophrenia is a psychosis because it is a different way when you have hallucination to deal with reality. 
But to be honest, autism is also a different way to experience reality in the way we experience our relationships with other human beings. So autism can be considered as a psychotic disease. Even if it is shocking, even if it is not in fashion, it can be considered like that. You have also neurotic disorder, borderline disorder, reactional disorder. And you will say, but where is depression in that? Depression can be psychotic, can be neurotic, can be borderline, can be rational. You can find depression in everywhere. This is not the problem. The problem is the structure, not the symptoms. And you have behavior and conduct disorder. And this is curious. Inside, you have uh, addiction, eating disorders, and OCD in the same category. This is very different, you see. It's very different than DSM. This is not the truth, of course. This is based on a psychodynamic background, obviously. This is a different way to consider patient. Another alternative to DSM comes from the US, the research domain criteria. This new classification is based not on psychoanalysis, of course, but on neuroscience. And it is, uh, it is sponsored by the NIAMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, the research institute about psychiatric disease. And you see there, no more depression, no more schizophrenia, no more psychosis. You have five axes, negative valence system, fear, anxiety, loss, frustrative, non-reward. You have positive valence system, motivation, reward, cognitive system, social process, and arousal and regulatory system. Why these five dimensions? Because there is a strong neurobiological background that say that they are relevant. And so it is supposed that if we want to do progress in neuroscientific research about psychiatric disorder, it should be better to use diagnosis, dimensional diagnosis based on neurobiological considerations. Why not? This is a different way to see psychiatric disorder. This is not the truth. This is not because it is neuroscience that it is the truth. The truth of mental disorder is nowhere. Just a clinical case to put that into practice. This is a real case that I saw with my dear friend Gordon Harper in Boston, in the US. So it, it, it was a, a, a patient in in-hospital unit Mark, 14 years old, massive history of childhood abuse, repeated suicide attempts, engaged in a transgender process. So I could have seen this patient in France, typically. And Gordon, my friend, did a clinical interview exactly as I do my clinical interview, very open on the, the way the patient experienced life. But now came the time to, dis to discuss about the diagnosis. And my friend Gordon was a supervisor of the patient. And we, we asked to the psychiatrist in charge of Mark, what are, the, what are the diagnoses that correspond to this patient? And he said ADHD and resistant depression. OK. If you look at the DSM, you can say that this patient has ADHD and resistant depression. And they asked me, well, for you, Bruno, uh, what is the diagnosis of this patient? And I said, well, in France, I am sure that no child and adolescent psychiatrist will say that this patient has ADHD and resistant depression. So they were completely stunned. And they say, but what is the diagnosis? Well, it is a borderline patient. It is a borderline patient. Yes, but you cannot say that a 14 years old boy has a borderline personality disorder. This is not compatible with DSM. I say, I don't care. I don't care. This is, on my personal point of view, this patient 
has an history of borderline personality disorder, and this is the best way for me, for me, to label this patient in order to provide some care, and this is the main point. And so I arrive to my conclusion. At first, you have patient. Then you have a diagnosis. But in psychiatry, there is something very particular. Diagnosis, when you mention the word that correspond to the diagnosis, this can have a very strong symbolic impact on the patient physician relationship, and this is even more true in child and adolescent psychiatry where you have the family. When you say to a family the words autism, schizophrenia, even ADHD, it is sometimes as, you, as if you put your, uh, your hand in the face of the parents, you, you know. So you have to be very cautious about your words that you use every day in your practice. These words can have a direct impact on the way patients consider themselves. Of course, diagnosis can be also useful to determine prognosis. And of course, diagnosis are used to determine treatment, of course. But in psychiatry, the point is that we have many treatments and many, many different treatments you can have a psychoanalytic treatment, a CBT, drugs, speech therapy, etc., etc., etc. And the question is, uh, does a unique classification can be useful to determine all these different types of treatments? I consider no. I consider no. At the moment, DSM is the main, the mainstream classification because it is based on statistical grounds and that statistics deals quite well with the average, with the mean, with evidence-based medicine that relies on statistics. Okay, so as a first step, DSM is useful to organize treatments where are they, whether they are psychological, biological, or other treatment. But this is the first step. Now we have to use the second step. The second step is that if I want for my patient mark, if I want to, to choose the good psychological treatment, the good diagnosis is borderline personality disorder. Because you know perfectly that to deal with a borderline patient, as a psychotherapist, this is a real tough job. You have to be specifically trained to work with borderline patients. And so I need the borderline diagnosis to deal with Mark on a psychological point of view. And I need also some biological diagnosis like the research domain criteria propose, for instance, about attention, about the loss of control, about problem of anxiety, of loss. In borderline personality disorder, you have loss. And so I will be interested by this classification to determine the best biological treatment. And this is my last slide. In conclusion, about DSM. First, DSM-5, it is a good document. It is a good document. People who wrote DSM-5 are good psychiatrists. No doubt about it. And this is good to read it as a textbook. But this is not a Bible. This is not the truth. And if you look at carefully, the change provided in DSM-5 not, do not rely only on scientific grounds. They rely also on sociological consideration. Third point, if you use only DSM-5 in your clinical practice, I promise <coughs> After 5, 10, or 15 years, your level, your clinical skillfulness will decrease. So you have to use several classifications. You have to open your mind to different ways of seeing patients. And today, I think it is really time to consider classification 
that are theory driven. Theory driven either on psychological grounds, even on psychoanalytic grounds, no problem. And they can be driven also by biological, biological grounds because at the moment there is no grand unified theory in psychiatry. No discipline can say that there is a unique theory that can explain psychiatric patients. We need multiple theories. And thank you for your attention. Thank you.